Good afternoon and welcome to this latest Yellowstone Advisory webinar. Today's company presenting is Capita PLC and we're delighted to have with us Helen Paris, the Director of Investor Relations and Stephanie Little, Investor Relations Manager. I'd now like to hand over to Helen to start today's presentation. So I'm um, Helen Paris, Director of Investor Relations. I joined in mid-December. Um, I think some of you I may have spoken to already. And I'm joined uh, today by Stephanie Little, who's the Capita IR Manager. So we're planning on talking probably about 15 to 20 minutes, um, very much, I guess, using the full year results presentation as the basis, but hopefully spending a bit more time talking about sort of the outlook. So the forward looking uh, piece of the presentation. And then as Alex said, we should have um, plenty of time for questions afterwards. So if I start on the um, on the next uh, next slide, um, it's the usual disclaimer. Um, I will let you use uh, use your time later to read that in more detail, should you wish to. Um, so the next slide, as I said, um, uh, introduced ourselves. I joined mid December. Um, previously, was thirteen years at G4S, and prior to that, was at um, at BG Group, and before that, both on the buy side and the sell side. So let's go straight um, into the presentation. So just very quickly, really wanted to sort of a quick introduction to Capita. Um, I know many of you are very familiar with the group, but I just really wanted to reiterate, you know, some of what we see as the, the core sort of uh, invest, investment sort of qualities about the group. We're a much simplified business now. We're um, two core divisions, public service and experience. Obviously, we have a, a very small number of businesses in portfolio uh, still to sell, but you know, fundamentally, we are a much simpler and more focused business than we were before. And within those businesses, we have market leading positions. So we, in our public service business, we're the number one uh, supplier of software and IT supplier to the UK government. And we're number one here in the customer experience market and number five in Germany and in Europe. We have uh, 50,000 employees who are obviously uh, incredibly valuable to providing um, the, uh, the customer service and operational delivery of the business. Uh, we have uh, good positions in growing markets. So both our businesses uh, should have the opportunity and the, the potential to grow at around 5% per annum. And as you saw in the second half of last year, we we're making good progress on that. And you know that's something that we'll come on to. Part of what is driving the growth is really our move from being a business process outsourcer to a digital um, business um, process solutions sort of uh, supplier to, to customers and really helping their, their digital transformation of their own business. And we can talk through some examples of that. And one of the sort of the other big changes that we've made, um, particularly under uh, John Lewis, our CEO, is that the business has gone from being very, very heavily indebted to really a minimal uh, debt position. So at the end of 2022, we had net financial debt of just £85 million and net debt to, e of, to EBITDA of 0.5 times. So clearly in the sort of current uncertain economic environments, um, we feel in a very strong and resilient um, position going, going forward. So then on to the next slide, again, I just thought um, I would highlight, you know, some of the great things that Capita does um, within the two businesses. So within our uh, UK government business, we very much sort of specialise in niche areas where we, we, we really understand what, what the government department does. And what we we can really understand what they're what they're trying to deliver and um, to their end customers, which is you know, generally sort of the uh, the 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 UK um, public. Um, we we focus on areas such as uh, justice, central government, and transport. Things like managing the uh, ULE scheme um, here uh, in London, where where we are today. Um, we recruit all the officers and soldiers for the British Army in our defence, fire, and safety business. Um, Bit of a sore point maybe, but we collect over one and a half billion pounds of council tax for 850,000 house, 850, households. We've done one and a half million health assessments since 2012 under our, our PIP contract to support the NHS. 
Um, we have our education and learning business where we help 50,000 students um, access higher education through the disabled students allowance business that we administer. Um, so really looking to deliver you know, better experiences for citizens and do it in a cost effective way um, for, for the UK government. So the next business, um, which is our customer experience um, business, some of what we do um, is, is call centre um, management and increasingly are using digital technology, AI and so on to, again, make that as efficient as possible, both in terms of for our customer, but also for our uh, end user to make sure that they have a, a seamless customer experience, but also make sure that our people are helping those most in need. Um, we have our uh, financial services business, so managing life and pensions, for example, mortgage applications. Around a third of that business is, is our, I suppose, the remaining legacy uh, issue um, with which the group has, which is um, our closed book life and pensions business, which is, say, is around a third, so about 100 and probably about 150 million of revenue this year um, and is something that we can come back to is clearly has been and, and will probably likely be still a, a bit of a drag on the margin for this business. But then we have other multi industry sectors, particularly focusing on areas like energy utilities and retail, where actually, you know, sadly in the current cost of living crisis, we're seeing, you know, pretty good demand for additional help. For our, for, for our customers, you know, clients in that um, in those areas. So then on to the next slide. Um, you know, really, I hopefully what you took from the full year results was that the group, you know, is returned to growth. Uh, the focus is is helping. You know, our strategy is delivering, and we're seeing improving momentum. So we delivered four percent growth in the second half of the year. We think that's as a result of the focus. It's a result of the fact that we have competitive solutions, means that we are winning both in terms of new customers, but also even more importantly, really, is we're winning more work with existing customers, as well as having very high customer retention. And that high customer retention is because we have really transformed our reputation for delivering to clients. That's something that you, you can really see over the last um, few years. We have um, really absolutely done a massive turnaround. We've also um, started to see an improvement in profitability. So we've basically swung from a loss to a profit. And that's as a result of returning to growth, the mix of work that we're doing. So in terms of more digital uh, work and basically stickier contracts, and also as a result of the cost saving um, restructuring and transformation programs that were put in over the last few years. Um, as a result of really some of the actions that were taken a few years ago around the portfolio businesses, we have seen a significant strengthening in the balance sheet. Um, not only have we significantly reduced our debt, we've also really sort of transformed our pension, um, our pension deficit, and and really are on a much stronger footing. You know, in the current uh, financial situation, um, we have an increasingly um, agile and flexible workforce, and that's something that as Steph will come on to, it's very important in the very current, you know, in the current very tight labour market that basically our people are allowed to work generally where they want to, whether they want to work from home or from in the office. So they have a fully hybrid uh, work, workforce uh, policy. And that's delivering. We saw a 15 point increase in our employee net promoter score. Um, and one of the key opportunities really for us is to reduce employee attrition. It's one of the, the big sort of cost saving opportunities. And so to make people you know, happier where their work is, is obviously a clear sort of uh, indicator that, that we should be able to improve on that. And to so say really in the current sort of environments, we feel that we have a very resilient business, got good structural growth and where we have good market positions, where we have a clear strategy in terms of where we expect to grow um, going forward. And so, again, just really, to, I suppose, to reiterate where the group has come from, um, you know, we very much the first few years under um, John's leadership was around transforming the business. So initially we were in 10 client facing divisions. We're now down to two and really have sort of then a case of sort of making sure that we were able to improve the contract take on. Um, from my experience at G4S, that's really also very similar. To what Capita has done is make sure that we are absolutely clear about the sort of work that we should be bidding on and that we have the right risk reward type process and a much more disciplined approach 
than historically uh, capita I think was very much driven by driving top line growth and we've really transformed um, the, that that whole uh, risk process and as a result of that we've not taken on any um, material you know loss making contracts during that time and it's also as a result of that we're able to deliver better and why our operational delivery our performance um, our customer retention, all of those things have, have improved. And so we really are in a position now where we feel that we can, you know, accelerate. Um, we have a number of years where we're just trying to stabilise, not lose business. And we really now feel we can go much more on the front foot. Um, we have changed our um, incentive plans for our salespeople to be, again, much more looking at winning new business rather than just retaining existing business. As we come on to looking at reducing cost of attrition, continuing to look at where we can take out cost and also stepping up our investments in digital solutions for our customers. Again, that will be a virtual circle in terms of driving, driving growth um, also. Before I hand over to Steph, who's going to go through um, areas in a little bit more detail, I do also want to um, emphasize our purpose, which is very much our license to operate. And I know that you know, many companies talk about the good things that they do, but this we've this is absolutely fundamental to uh, Capita. And we do see this as the right thing to do, but it is also the thing that is helping us to win business. Um, we are um, very much seen as um, attracting people because they want to work for a purpose-led responsible business. Um, our social value commitments help us win bids. We, can, we have a number of examples uh, with that. So the fact that we are a living wage payer, the fact that we have committed to net zero by 2035, um, we have uh, fair tax accreditation, we, have, uh, we are well ahead of, of the norm in terms of what we spend with SME companies, companies um, our suppliers, our modern slavery assessment. These are all things that um, we think are making us a, a good company and will make us a sustainable business um, for the future. And, and uh, so I'll now sort of hand over to Stephanie, who'll go through some of what we're trying to do in terms of reducing um, employee attrition. Hi, I'm Stephanie, um, as Helen said. Um, I've been with Capita for around three years now. And prior to that, I trained as a big four audit manager. I've kind of focused on PLC listed groups, um, which is when I then made a move across to Capita. Um, so as Helen says, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking through um, employees. Um, obviously, we have 50,000 employees. You know, they're at the heart of our business as such a people heavy firm. Um, at the moment, we're in one of the tightest labour markets that we've seen for years, and we've seen that in our attrition numbers. Um, attrition this year actually was flat at around 30 percent, but actually it's a bit more of a nuanced story underneath that. Um, we've put in very clear um, engagement um, structures in place to try and improve our attrition. And we really saw good results with that in public and our TSS division, which is our technology division. And actually now the um, final issue that we have really is within our capita experience business, where again, we are working on work, um, fixing that issue. Um, one of the big things that will really help attrition in this business, to be honest, is um, our working from home model. Um, as you can see on the slide, 85% of our home based or hybrid employees say that their working arrangements are a reason they want to stay with Capita. And actually what we see is for those that are home based or hybrid, we see much lower sickness and absenteeism. So it really is helping our ability to staff our work at the moment. Um, now, if I move on just to our financial highlights very quickly, um, Helen, I know, has talked you through some of these on the summary slide, but I'll just talk you through in slightly more detail. Um, so as you can see, um, revenue was up 2.4% this year with a strong performance in public and portfolio and stabilisation in capita experience. Um, experience actually grew by just under 1% this year, which in 2021, they declined by 10%. So we really have seen a stabilisation of the revenue there. We saw a significant improvement in our operating profit, PBT and EBITDA, reflecting the revenue growth, the efficiency of delivery and the completion of our restructuring programme, which finished in 2021. 
Um, we also delivered positive free cash flow as expected. Um, that is pre-lease payments, um, but it was a very important milestone for the group as a whole. Um, and then as Helen's touched upon, we reduced our net debt by 397 million this year as a result of the disposal program, which means we're well below actually our target um, net financial debt to EBITDA ratio, which our target is one and we were at 0.5 times. Um, so as we've talked about, um, at the moment, we are working through a disposal program to dispose of non-core businesses, really good businesses, but just not core to Capita's future business and public and experience. Um, so we have been selling those, which has also then helped our balance sheet. So um, post results, we announced the sales of the people pillar, um, which we've now ticked off in this presentation. Um, which leaves us with about 150 million of revenue to sell and about 16 million of profit uh, for the numbers that are on the right hand side of this screen. Um, we've launched all of the processes for the remaining pillars and we're continuing to target sale by half year, depending on the market condition. I think the point to note here is that given where we are with our net debt number, um, there's no rush to sell these. So it's the balance of maximizing the proceeds, but also making sure that we find the right owners for the business. Um, then if I move on to liquidity, um, so we continue to have strong liquidity. Um, at year end, we were undrawn on our RCF compared to 40 million drawn um, at the prior year end. Um, last year, we repaid nearly 230 million of private placement loan notes. And this year already, we've now paid another 40 million. So I think the graph on this slide really shows that we've broken the back of the liquidity challenge. Um, and actually, we have a strong liquidity position going forwards. Now, if I move you on to our guidance slide, sorry, trying to multitask here, too many things. Could you do a two of the clicker. Um, if I move you on to the guidance, so this guidance is for core capita. And just to confirm, core capita is capita public and experience with all of the overheads that we have, kind of excluding portfolio, given our plan to sell those businesses kind of by the half year. Um, so revenue, we're targeting further growth from the 2.4% delivered this uh, last year uh, with continuing momentum from the 4% that we saw in H2 of last year. Um, as Helen said, the markets that we're operating are growing at around 5% per annum. So we're targeting mid single digit revenue growth in line with those markets. Um, our EBITDA margin for the core group last year was 2.9% and we're targeting to at least double that in the medium term. Our medium term is our forecasting period, which is three years. That's kind of the stretch that we're looking at there. Then in terms of our cash generated by operations, um, we're looking at that will be a similar level um, in 2023 um, with an increase in CapEx from the increased spend in digital offerings that we're looking at in 2023. And I should point out that the digital offerings are across both divisions. It's not just in one. Um, and then we expect further low levels of net financial debt as we finish on our disposal program and continue to generate the free cash flow that we've talked about. Um, and then finally, our target remains that our net debt to adjusted EBITDA would be below one times. Then if I look at our enablers for growth, um, we've outlined at the year end results that actually top line growth is going to be a primary driver for improving the group's financial position. Um, and that will be driven by winning new business, growth on our existing clients and then renewals. Um, you can see that we have a really, really high renewal rate within the group at the moment. In fact, last year, Capita Experience had a 99% uh, renewal rate, which is pretty strong. Uh, but now we are looking at focusing on new clients and growth on account to grow the business that way, which will be driven by delivering really well for our existing clients to open up new growth opportunities and winning new work. Um, and as Helen said, our sales compensation has been changed ever so slightly this year so that we are really incentivizing those to be winning growth on account and new clients to drive that top line growth. Then um, if I bring you on to where our growth is for both of the divisions, I think this slide captures really, really well the fact that within the Capita Public, we have a really healthy mix of renewals, growth on accounts and then new clients. Um, 
we've got a weighted pipeline of 1.2 billion, which is up from last year. Now, part of that is due to the shenanigans in um, the government in Q3 of last year, which meant we saw quite a few material bids shifting from H2 of last year into H1 of this year. They've not been lost. It's just the timeline has moved into early this year rather than last year. Um, so as you can see, we've got some really great opportunities with the Department for Work and Pensions that we won last year, continuing to expand on TFL, where we continue to deliver really well. And then this year, we've got some really good opportunities with the Education Authority, the Student Loans Council and Integrated Care. And then we have a really similar picture for capital experience. You know, we've got a really diverse portfolio in that business um, and a weighted pipeline this year of one billion um, with a big chunk of that being in renewals for this year. Uh, last year, at the start of the year, you may remember that we announced um, the extension of our BBC TV licensing contract. And then towards the end of the year, we announced um, the renewal of the Mobilecom Freenet contract. Um, this year, Year. Again, we've got some really great opportunities. And in fact, Commerzbank, which was on this slide, we have now won. Um, and then we've got further growth on account opportunities with Scottish Power, which you may remember was a new win last year. So another factor in increasing the margin other than growth is moving some of our contracts from more of a BPO model to a digital BPS, which can often drive a higher margin. Um, we're capitalizing on the shift from digital. Um, so one example that we saw last year was on our Barnet contract, where we actually handed back some of the more BPO elements. And what we've actually kept and retained on that contract was the more digital BPS elements, which can drive a higher margin as they're more digitally enabled. I move on to the next slide. Then another driver of margins will be cost savings within the group. Um, we've listed on this slide some of the examples of where we're seeing cost savings, and that's from you know, improved execution. We no longer have the four problem contracts that we'd talked to previously and that we still are doing that business, but they are no longer the drain on the business that they were as they're all profitable. Um, and we're seeing kind of sensible margins come through on those. We have continuous improvement programs where we are investing in our delivery centers and we're starting to see teams using more standard tools and processes rather than every single solution being completely contract specific and built on a one by one basis. We're really sharing more across the group. And then another benefit from our virtual first model is reducing our property footprint. So, for example, in London, we used to have four offices. Now we just have the one that Helen and I are sat in. Um, and then we're also reducing um, our UK footprint to move to a more hub and spoke model. So we still have plenty of offices around the UK, but we no longer have the full call centres where people are choosing to work from home more. Um, we've listed here some opportunities for 2023. So one of the big ones that we've spoken about is reducing attrition. Um, you know, if we can get the 30% attrition down, that will have a big impact, particularly on capita experiences, margin achievement. Um, and then there's further efficiencies that we can get from reducing and having a lean corporate overhead where we met, match the corporate overhead to the size of the group we are now compared to what we were kind of 18 months ago. Then if I move on to the summary, I'll pass back on to Helen before we open for Q&A. Yeah, so just um, just a few sort of closing remarks before we go to Q&A. You know, we really feel that we have good, you know, strong operational momentum and really have the right platform in place to deliver improved financial performance. Uh, we saw a turnaround in our financial performance in 2022. As I mentioned again, we're strongly positioned in growth market markets. We expect to at least double our core uh, capita EBIT margin over the medium term. Um, we've outlined the reasons, you know, I, the ways that we expect to get that. And I think what you can see is there are sort of multiple levers that we expect to pull on to be able to do that. Um, our balance sheet has been materially um, strengthened and we expect to see improving cash conversion as the business grows. But also because we have resolved many of the legacy issues of the past, we don't have the same sort of drain um, on cash and should see improving cash conversion um, going, going forward. So um, with that, um, Alex, I think I hand back to you to start with the Q&A. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, presentation. Glad to see that the hard work is uh, hard work over the last few years is uh, is paying off. 
Um, we are now going to take your questions. And just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and cover as many questions uh, as we can in the, in the, in the time available. I'm going to start with a couple uh, that have come in on margins. Um, and uh, the similar questions. One is capita experience margins have recovered well, but are still quite low. What could margins get to in this division? Um, and you have a target to at least double the 2.9% EBIT margin in the medium term. And, and what does the medium term mean? I think you did clarify that in the presentation, but if you could just respond to that, that would be great. Yeah, that's right. So as uh, Steph said, our, our planning cycle is three years. So medium term for us is basically 20, by 2025 in terms of the sort of reported numbers um, at, at that in that in that year is when we would expect to, to get there. Um, you're, you're right, the experience um, margin is lower um, than we would want it to be and where we expect it to be in the future. Um, and it is really that business is, I guess, almost sort of 18 months, two years behind the, um, the capital public business in terms of the reorganization, the focus, uh, the management team and so on. Uh, on the public side, it's much more embedded and you can see that it's on a, you know, it's on a really good uh, growth um, trajectory. Experience is improving, but it's still a, a bit of a step behind. Um, experience margin, they're looking at, you know, number of ways again looking to um, improve the growth so very much focusing on on core sectors where they see um the ability to be sort of competitive um in terms of understanding the customer um also in terms of how we deliver to the customer so whether it's uh onshore, offshore, uh, a hybrid um, of that, looking at really making sure that we have a very sort of flexible cost model. And again, the sort of hybrid working, all of those things feed into that. We also, um, as I mentioned, we have this sort of the last albatross, as it were, which is the um, closed book life and pension business, which um, will have had revenue of about 170 million in 2022. That business, in effect, is loss making. Um, we make a provision um, each year, um, but it's basically a drag on the on the profitability and of the margin of that business. Um, that business, because of it being a closed book, as it were, is declining probably somewhere between 10, 20 percent per annum. So it becomes over time less of a drag um, than it than it has been. So it becomes a, a a reducing proportion um, of that business and, and our other uh, pension life business is, is a very good business. So again, I'd say so multiple um, levers on which to um, which to pull on, um, but where we definitely see the opportunity to um, to improve margins and and you'll probably have realized that that really experienced business is the big sort of swing factor on getting the group margin to double because the capital public business is, is close to that already, really. Um, and again, I guess that business growing well, uh, more opportunity also for higher margin, um, uh, digital enabled contracts, that also helps the mix also. So as I say, we're not, we're not, we don't have to have one big silver bullet to deliver on this. We've got multiple different areas, as well as, as, as we mentioned, some of the things like the overheads and so on that should be appropriate for a group, you know, that has shrunk, it, you know, it has. And, you know, sometimes I think it's misreported, you know, that our revenues have gone down and so on. Well, it has because we sold businesses so on a reported basis, it would have done. But from an underlying point of view, we can see um, that the, the group is, is growing again. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Um, good uh, segue onto a question coming in here about disposals. Could you provide some more color on the disposals and how they're tracking? And there was a, a comment um, reference from Tim Weller on the FY22 results conference call. Do you still see capita having um, financial pre-IFRS net debt below zero by the end of half one 2023? Yeah, I think one of the analysts used the word awash with cash um, <laughs> at, year, at half year. Um, so you know, we continue to make really good progress on the disposals. It was really good to see the um, people business sale uh, soon after our results. Um, I think if you look at the revenue left to sell, where we've had 250, now 150 million of revenue, 
Um, I think we would be a little bit disappointed if you didn't see that reduced to nil or just below uh, based on what we have achieved to date. Um, and you know, as we said, the focus is on maximising the proceeds. We're not selling these because we need the cash in desperately. We're selling them because it's the right thing to do for the long term strategy of the businesses. Um, and like I said, there are some really good businesses in there. And, you know, part of the reason that maybe they're some of the latter ones to sell is um, the travel business, for example, was really heavily impacted by COVID and the pandemic. So I think a lot of buyers are waiting to see what a post COVID world looks like for that business. And that we also want to see that um, in the sales. Um, so, yeah. Timing is, is is important as well, but clearly we don't need to sell them, but we want to because it makes you know strategic sense to. But yeah, we should be, as I say, hopefully in a small um cash positive position on a on a pre-IFRS uh, 16 basis. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, as you'd expect, we've had a lot of questions um that have come in. We had a couple of questions ahead of time, and quite a few have come in on this webinar regarding uh the cyber uh, leak or the cyber incident. Um, one of the questions is, could you explain sort of what happened? So that might be a useful yeah. starting point to explain to people what happened. And then, you know, if I group some of the other questions, they seem to be around and, you know, what's the likely cost? Can you tell us a bit more about how this incident uh, is being resolved? Um, so let's, should we start with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have to so apologize uh, ahead of time to say I'm, I'm going to be very restricted in what I can say, obviously, um, based on... Um, it's very much going to be reiterating probably what we said before in our RNS of the 20th of uh, April. Um, as you'll be aware, um, the the group was subject to a cyber incident. Um, we 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 now know that um, there was unauthorized access um, into our IT systems. I think it's around the 22nd of, of March. Um, we discovered that um, and basically interrupted it on the 31st of March, which. Um, Seems like quite a long time, but from what I understand, that's a very, very short time compared to often how these uh, incidents can evolve, can be uh, many months that you have threat actors within your uh, within your systems. And so the fact that we were able to interrupt uh, the access, um, I think very much limited the impact. Um, from the 20th of April release, we said that uh, we believe that a small proportion of the data that was on basically 4% of our servers um, had potentially, potentially been um, accessed. And that's basically where really all I can sort of say on that. Um, our forensic investigations continue um, as and when we have more information, we will obviously um, update the market um, as appropriate. I would say that we have reconnected uh, to all our customers um, the fact that, as I say, we were able to, um, be, you know, we, we were able to um, uh, sort of in, interrupt the, the access quite quickly in this, in this, in this case means that um, we, we think that we very much limited the, uh, the, the, the impact on the business. Um, very, it was only a very small proportion of our customers that were impacted. Um, and for the vast majority, it was business as usual. And so that has been the case obviously uh, uh, since then, um, it, it is a, an ongoing, um, say, investigation. And I'm sure in time we will be able to share more information about sort of what and happened. Um, I think from the initial understanding is that it was human error. So although that you can do all the things in terms of investment and uh, education and all of these things which are really important um, and I know when I did my onboarding I had to do all of this stuff when I joined Capita um, unfortunately um, you know you you cannot 100% um, uh, prevent these incidents from happening um, and unfortunately they are quite common um, in the current corporate environment um, and I think that you know, by no means was this a positive event for us, but um, I think that it was uh, limited in terms of um, what the, say, the access that that uh, that they had. Um, and as I say, we will be certainly, you know, hoping to update at some point and and really draw underline, uh, you know, a line under this um, hopefully soon. Okay, brilliant. There's just one follow up question 
to that. Um, it may be too early for you to answer this, but has the cyber incident affected the customer's pipeline and win rates? Um, not that we are um, aware of at all. Um, we are aware of a number of contracts that we were um, bidding for, renewals, new work that are continuing with that process. Um, I'm sure there probably was a short pause with some of them for them, you know, IT people and so on to understand um, what, what had happened. Um, our IT people have been very busy, you know, dealing with other customers, IT departments to give them comfort, basically. And that's why we have reconnected to all of our all of our customers. So, um, no, I think the I think there's general sort of awareness that um, it's unfortunate part of um, the modern world that we live in that these incidents happen. And so um, we we don't uh, we don't see any any uh, impact in terms of the pipeline or the uh, the work that we are doing. OK, thank you. Uh I'm going to move to another topic here, and that's uh, one that you mentioned a couple of times, which is the attrition rates. And um, I wondered yeah. if you could give us the um, the main reason for attrition. You know, what do people cite in their exit interviews? Um, and then going on to how are your attrition rates trending in 2023 so far? Uh, and there's a follow up to that, but I'll, I'll let you answer those two first before coming on to the follow up. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. Fine. So I think one thing that I would point out is actually our capita experience business, you would expect to have a elevated attrition rate due to the nature of the business. There's a lot of seasonal workers that we get um, in that business. So for example, university students who are in between terms that want to come and earn some money for kind of a few uh, a few months at a time. So the um, attrition rate will always be inflated in that business. Um, I think one of the key reasons that um, people are leaving is um, actually, it's quite a difficult job. I've sat in some of our call centers and I've actually, the number of screens and multitasking um, that the people in the call centers have to do is, it is a really difficult job. It's quite, it's a taxing role um, and we are a real living wage payer, but actually when you also have real living wage payers um, with the likes in the, in the retail sector, for example, which is perceived as a slightly easier job, people are moving around as a result of that. Um, you know, last year, um, Amazon, for example, offered a 1000 pound signing sign on bonus. Um, if you stayed for three months, we could never compete with that. So we saw high attrition around the time that Amazon were offering bonuses like that. Um, but as I said, you know, our employee value proposition are now starting to really see capita and that division as a really meaningful employment and career path. We are starting to see the green shoots. And one thing um, actually to note on that is really in capita experience, it was four contracts where we were seeing the really high elevated levels of attrition. Um, the good news is, first of all, management now um, are incentivized around improving attrition, which really does show the focus that we have on that as, on a business. And the good news also is that in 2023 so far, we have seen that attrition start to come down. It's still higher than where we would like it to be, but we're starting to see progress certainly in the right direction. Okay. If we look at sort of all the costs involved in terms of recruitment, training, downtime, because uh, obviously it, it, somebody is is being trained, they have to uh, be, you know, they're, they're not necessarily providing a lot of service for, for a number of weeks. Um, it's a tens of millions cost to the business. You know, this is a big prize potentially that we can go after. Um, and the, the tight labour market and the things that Steph has has, um, has emphasized means that you know it is quite challenging to try and reduce attrition but one of the reasons that we um, basically focused the annual salary review was at the the lower end um, earners within the group was because we recognized that that's where there was the biggest opportunity um, and so basically people earning over 120,000 were asked to forfeit, forfeit salary increase for 2023 whereas those in the in the lower end in the but still real living wage would have got I think it was over 10 11 percent salary increase yeah. so we recognize that there's a real benefit um in, in trying to to keep um to pe keep those people on on the front line delivery okay thank you and then the follow-up question is that with the with the upcoming U.S. recession um are you seeing that assist with your um attrition story at, at capita 
and I guess linked to that moving on from attrition is that um, if there is a US recession, how do you see that contraction impacting your business? Just clarify, you're saying US, not UK. Um, well, I guess the, the question is about the upcoming US recession um, and, and the impact that might have, I guess, then on recession on the slowdown. The rest of the world. Yeah. 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 I mean, I could start if you, I mean, I think that um, we're, we're in a, the, the main issue for us is, is that we have this ridiculously tight labor market. So, you know, although, we, you know, we've got inflation and cost of living crisis, it's actually just hard to get people to work. Now we've lucked we into, into work. We're in a, a much stronger position than we were, I think 18 months ago when we actually found it hard to resource and grow um, with some contracts. That's not a problem. We are being able to attract people. It's just now we've got to put in an extra effort to, to keep them because of the same tightness, the labor market. So, you know, the salary increases, the, the hybrid working. Um, it also means hybrid working means that we are able to attract people to work for us. They probably wouldn't be able to work otherwise because they've got the ability to work from home. So whether it's they have other uh, care uh, responsibilities or whether because they themselves have um, have some uh, physical disabilities or challenges. So so it's it's something. So I would say in terms of if we go if we went into a global recession, um, what would it mean in terms of the impact on the labour market? Any sort of freeing up in the labour market is potentially a positive. You have to think about the very defensive nature of our UK government business. You know, everybody's still going to carry on, you know, doing all the other things. They're going to have to carry on paying the council tax, got to pay their TV licence or whatever it is. So we do have, a, uh, I think, quite a defensive business. And on the customer experience business, um, as I've mentioned, in areas like utilities, retail, we've seen a growth because of the cost of living crisis that you know our customers are saying you know we've got more people with more questions about you know about their their, their electricity accounts or whatever so so we are um I, I don't I wouldn't say we are in any way recession proof um but we would probably be more defensive than than some other sectors okay thank you um, and one final sort of attrition question where do you think attrition could get to for capita what, what do you think it could come down to I think probably for the business as a whole, bearing in mind experience will always have slightly elevated. I think you'd be looking at kind of low twenties would be kind of a steady state, good level of attrition. Um, and as Helen said, that's a tens of millions of pounds worth prize to the group if we can get there. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to, to revenues and profits. Could you advise what the normal half one, half two split is likely to be for both revenues and operating profit? Yeah, so I think from a revenue perspective, um, we talked to seeing 4% momentum uh, or growth in H2 of last year. I think you'd expect that to be ever so slightly higher in H1 of this year, um, and then maybe slightly lower in H2, actually, uh, which is slightly different to the um, tracking that we had last year. So this year, we're expecting actually to see slightly more in H1 compared to H2. And then from a profit perspective, um, one thing that actually impacts our profit is the holiday pay accrual, which impacts our business quite a lot as a very people heavy business. Um, so what we see generally is most uh, employees will take most of their leave in the second half of the year. And that creates for the group a liability, um, which under the accounting rules, you effectively book because you pay everyone a consistent pay wage every single day but if they've not taken half their holiday then technically you have uh, o o underpaid them for that period um so that kind of creates a bit of it's about a 20 million delta between our h1 and h2 uh, numbers every year this year we are expecting profits to be slightly h1 weighted which is a bit different to last year where they were h2 weighted um and then cash flow, we expect to be um, H2 weighted compared to H1. OK, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions around uh, dividends. Um, okay. One, uh, when do you anticipate returning to paying a dividend? And the other one is what conditions need to be in place for dividends to be restarted? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so 
uh, I guess we're sort of moving to a point where we're becoming a more normal company now. And the idea of being able to pay a dividend or go back on the dividend list is, is, is more realistic. Uh, I think that, as um, Tim said in March, that once we've completed the disposal programme, which we expect to have done you know, materially uh, by the half year, or certainly have uh, made a lot of progress on that, um, that we would give an update in terms of our sort of clarity on our capital allocation policy. So um, I don't want to preempt anything that the board may say then, but I think you'll get um, an indication then of, of what we're thinking in terms of you know what 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 the uh, investment needs of the business are versus uh, what we can basically sort of you know share back with our our, our shareholders. Um, we are very conscious of the fact that really um, in the last few years it's the bond holders, the debt holders, and the pension pensioners that have had the benefit of the cash from the disposals and so on, and that really you know are very patient as shareholders. Are you know are, are there to also be sort of rewarded rewarded for their loyalty? Um, I think that based on the profile of what we're investing in this year, in terms of our um, you know step up of, of some digital um, investment for 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 our, you know our, our product um, facing uh, digital services, that we are um, probably looking at whether we would return to paying a dividend in twenty twenty four. So in terms of the um, meetings that we've had with, you know, larger shareholders and so on, um, those were sort of the discussions in terms of being in a position where we can see line of sight in terms of having good sustainable cash flow. So that would basically be, you know, as you say, what is it? What are the catalysts? It's uh, it's 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 net free cash flow that we would then be able to uh, have a dividend that is therefore, you know, growing and sustainable. Um, I think the board will be looking at a number of options, looking at dividends, looking at buybacks. But I would imagine that um, a, a buyback is something that is usually where you have a lot of excess cash from a, an M&A uh, situation or something like that. Um, I, I would imagine that it's something that we will look at more from a dividend perspective. But as I say, that's something that the board will be considering in the coming months ahead of the, the half year where it's now you know, an obvious time for them to give a, a, a clarity around that capital allocation policy for the group. OK, brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, a question here. Any chance of a rebranding? Um, and the questioner has uh, offered a name, Social X, but uh, do you want to, has, has a rebranding of the company been considered? Uh, well, so we rebranded, I'm trying to think, just before I joined three and a bit years ago. Um, I've not heard any murmurings since then, although it might be good because actually the navy blue that we print in is really quite annoying to print from the printers, so we could get rid of some of the navy blue. I don't think so. I actually think that particularly within the public sector, Capita has a really, really strong brand now. Um, you know, our clients really respect the work that we do. We've got some really long relationships there. Um, and as much as, you know, some may think of branding would be a good idea. I actually think that in the markets we're operating, the brand that we have is a really strong brand to have. OK, thank you. It can um, be a very expensive exercise. I can't see us <laughs> here going for that at all. <laughs> I think that I think that we have transformed the uh, the operational delivery to our clients, and so yeah, I'm you know I'm aware of some of the the other names that the group has been called, and we, we really feel that that is just not the case, and we 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 see that through the feedback that we get from customers, a very strong. Uh, retention rate from the customer net promoter score are, are you know are, are fantastic so I don't I don't think as Steph says we wouldn't see the feel the need to spend money on rebranding okay thank you uh, question here what do you think are the drivers of the suppressed share price and uh, what can management do about this um I would say that um you know clearly Clearly, the, 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 the business was very challenged. Um, you had um, onerous contracts, you had a significant financial debt, you had a large pension deficit. Um, we then had, you know, we had COVID and all of these things. And, and I think that it's really around um, 
we've just got to have a, a period of stability, delivery, execution, show that all the things that we've said that we expect um, that we deliver on. And, and I think that that's very much, um, you know, wh wh where we are focused, you know, clearly the um, cyber incident is a bit of a blip, but I think, you know, the fundamentals remain. And so where we would expect to see, you know, continued progress for this year, next year. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that there would be some people that will have, you know, had their fingers burnt and we just need to show them that the business is a very different business managed in a very different way um, than how it was um, previously. So I think it's, it's all around delivery and execution, which it is often with, you know, these sorts of um, businesses. Again, from my thinking of my experience of uh, G4S, it would be very similar. Brilliant. Uh, we've got a, two two more questions to go, and I think we've got yeah. time to do them both, so I'm going to ask them. So we know yeah. from if you want about the pipeline, uh, we know from FY 2022 results that some of the public sector sales pipelines slipped into 2023. How are these opportunities, such as the DWP extension tracking? Yeah, uh, they're, they're tracking well. Um, I guess our outlook on those hasn't changed at all. Um, although on some of the bigger deals that we have, you do frustratingly see the sales cycle get longer and longer. Like I said, the our outlook hasn't changed on those. Um, it's purely just the timing of when we actually expect to be announcing anything around them. I guess the thing to say as well is that some of those would, would have limited impact and benefit on 2023. So uh, just because of the, the timing of, you know, even when you win, you've got a long lead time in terms of the work starting. So they're not so important in terms of in-year revenue. Um, and, you know, sometimes we don't have absolute control over, you know, the timing of when those contracts are awarded. Um, um, but I think what happens in the meantime is that, you know, we, we're often doing the existing work in maybe in a different structure and um, the contract just gets extended. So... Uh, you know, and again, I think, you know, an obvious question is you've got potentially an election year next year. What happens then? Well, again, you go into a period of sort of bit of sort of not a lot happening. So our existing contracts just roll over and just get extended. And, and we've started to see some of that in some of the work that we're doing. So, you know, when you've had, say, quite a lot of change within government, um, it can just mean that some of these things get delayed, um, delayed and delayed. But when we are already in incumbents, um, the, the impact is more limited. OK, thank you. Um, I've got a final question here. It's very difficult for private investors to get access to analyst research. Um, would you consider yeah. um, uh, making some analyst research available to, to private investors? Um, thank you. I have a lot of sympathy. I think that I'm not really sure who benefited from it. It certainly wasn't uh, private investors. Um, we're just not allowed to, um, basically, under the under the banks. Um, we're not allowed to forward the research. Uh, we're even very restricted in terms of what we can do with it internally. So we're allowed to sort of basically to share it between ourselves, CEO, CFO, and we, we're not even sharing it with executive committee members and so on, um, because this is paid for research um, in effect. Um, we are aware that there are, um, you know, other um, there are other research houses where we could pay for research to be written um, on capita. So, you know, you know, there are a number of um, providers that do that. And I guess, you know, I say I'm relatively new to capita. One of the things that we're thinking about is, you know, where we have our own IR budget um, for the retail investors. Um, where do we focus that? So obviously we're doing an event like this with Yellowstone, um, you know, but but that's something that I think we will be looking at is how do we best spend our money um, and in terms of where is the, the best benefit um, for retail investors. We're trying to be more active on things like the um, LSE um, platform. Um, we are, you know, we would neither of us think our IR site is great on the website. So if there's any ways that we can improve that, but um, we're looking at things like the private client broker market. Um, but yes, if if any of your uh, any of the people you know who are listening today would have a view on what they find most useful. Useful. Uh, we're very much, you know, open to any suggestions. You know, I've had I've had other brokers say, "Oh, don't don't waste your money on paid research." So it's, you know, I we're we're, we're I say we're in an open we're open minded at the moment. 
Okay, well, I guess speaking as a as a private investor too, I, I think uh, uh, it would be great to have something available. And there are, as you say, a number of providers of that uh, private research, so or private investor research. So, um, anyway, that brings us to the end of today's webinar with uh, Capita. Uh, Helen and Stephanie, thank you very much for presenting and thank you very much for answering all those questions uh, very clearly. Um, as uh, people leave today, there is a, a feedback form that we ask you to complete. It will only take uh, a few moments of your time. So please, if you could uh, complete that feedback, um, we'd most uh, appreciate that. Um, and then finally, just to flag up, there are a couple of webinars coming up. Um, we've got Sainsbury's coming up in a joint presentation with ShareSoc on the 22nd of May. On the 6th of June, we have Hercules Site Services, and on the 19th of June, Castings PLC. So thank you again for everyone for attending, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.